That's interesting because this isn't even close to my first slide, so we'll, we'll, we'll just back up a little bit from here. <laughs> Let's go back. Good morning, everyone. Hello. I know a few too many people here to, to be perfectly comfortable, so this is kind of like a confessional, intimate thing. There was some tweeting going on about taking my shirt off, but there will be no such shirtlessness uh, today. So um, my name is Matthew. Um, I run a design and branding firm uh, with my good partner, Roy White. I don't know if Roy's showed up yet. Oh, yes, there you go. Um, and uh, we have a lovely office in Gastown, and we do a lot of work uh, for a variety of uh, clients. Is that yours? That is yours. Take your Speak into that so they can hear you. All right, that I will. Hi, everybody. I'm used to projecting on stage, so that's, yeah. Um, uh, we do a lot of design and branding work for a wide variety of clients. Um, and uh, so our day gig is, is you know, very top to bottom uh, design projects that we do. Not really what I'm talking about today. I've been challenged with, uh, with a few different things today. Uh, one of the challenges is to talk about uh, connecting. Uh, of course, the obvious thing to do with connection would be to talk about um, people, uh, place, uh, maybe culture. This would be the, the obvious way to go, but anybody who knows me knows that I live a lot more inside my head than I do in the real uh, interrelational world. Um, so, of course, I, I'm not going to talk about that at all. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is some of the stuff that, for me, informs me as a person and, and uh, kind of strange connections throughout my life that have come together with creativity. Let me turn this way. I'm going to hold it, am I? Okay. There you go. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the connections in my life and my career, um, the, the strange connections in my head, and I think a lot of people will uh, relate to uh, this, this idea of creativity. And uh, some of the creative ideas I really enjoy and, and how that comes together. So I, I titled this because I had to have a fancy title to, to know what I was doing. Uh, synapses and synecdoches. And I hope everybody looked up synecdoche on the way here. Uh, it's an awesome word. And I actually said to my wife, I want to call this something like synapses and synecdoches. And then went, I got to look it up. I don't actually know what that word means, but it sounds so perfect. And I looked it up and went, it's absolutely exactly what I mean. Uh, so that's good news. Um, my, my subtitle for this, because uh, you always have to have a subtitle, is How to Accurately Identify and Exploit Your Neuroses for Fun and Profit. Um, that's ultimately what I do for a living. Um, it's strange. I mean, I am, in fact, a, a creative professional for a living, which not everyone who speaks at Creative Mornings is, so I come kind of from the straight and narrow version of creativity. Um, but I have sort of a strangely uneasy relationship with creativity, and I'm going to show a lot of uh, famous quotes from famous people up here. Um, so that you, you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I do, so I, I, it's strange. Uh, for me, creativity has always been this, this chaotic, magical, um, you know, you, you're channeling something, it comes from up here, it's a star seed, and, and, and you're kind of a conduit to creativity. But it's random, it's, it's unharnessable, it's kind of uh, terrifying on one level. And that always made me uncomfortable, even though I was you know, a creative kid, it, it, I found it kind of terrifying. And the other side of, of my personality, which is more empirical and logical and intellectual, that made me feel a lot safer. It felt like something I could control, I could put in a box, and uh, it made sense to me. Uh, I'll, I'll explain later why, in fact, it makes me kind of... Um, but uh, this felt safer. Uh, and I had a lot of backup for this. So uh, through my life, I, I learned a lot of things, and, uh, and this is an excellent uh, phrase, which you should take today for me. Um, but forever, and this one is actually a famous quote. This, of course, is Plato. Um, he didn't exactly say it like this. Um, basically, what he said was, in his ideal republic, which is about truth and virtue and honor, um, if someone comes into town who's a poet, who's an actor, uh, you should bow to them. You should say how fantastic and marvelous their skills are. You should put a wreath on their head and boot them out of town. Um, they are not someone you want to have around. Uh, they are absolutely a terrible influence on this ideal republic. Um, 
And he had a compelling argument. And that argument really came from, he's got two allegories in, in Plato's Republic. Uh, the one allegory is called the allegory of the line. Uh, he divides uh, perception and reality into the intelligible world and the visible world. The intelligible world, it starts with forms. So um, podiumness, okay? So out there exists the idea of podiumness. Nobody invented it. Nothing can be created. It's created by the divine of good. Um, so there's podiumness that we all say if I say I'm standing at a podium. You don't need to see it. You know what I'm talking about. So podiumness exists. There's then the mathematical equation that equals that podium. There's dimensions, there's corners, there's maybe some algebra involved, but there's the mathematical. That's the intelligible world. That's the, the world of ideas. You go to the next level and you end up with visible things. This is, in fact, a podium. It is, it is uh, a representation of podiumness and the algorithms of podiumness, but it is, in fact, a podium. Uh, and then, of course, there's the lowest level, which would be what a lot of people here do, which is we draw or take a photo of a podium, right? So, in fact, you know, bloggers probably, like, pin somebody else's photo of a drawing of a podium, right? <laughs> so, we are so many levels down from this ideal truth that, uh, that how could we not be an, a terrible influence in the Republic? Uh, in one more allegory, and it's my favorite allegory, and I'll tell you in a moment, Allegory of the cave. This is the same idea, but taken from a different, different vantage point. We are all prisoners in the cave. We're tied up. We can't move our head. We're staring straight ahead. Behind us is a platform. And on that platform are moved various objects. They're moved back and forth uh, on this podium. Behind that is a fire. And that fire is casting a light to a shadow in front of us. We can see the shadow. So our idea of reality is, in fact, a shadow of an object being cast by a fire. Um, so the fire is maybe one step closer to truth, right? It's at least the caster of the, of the light. The object is just an object. But this idea of the, the, um, the form, the ideal form, we would not know unless we untied ourselves, got out of the cave, and in fact saw the sun. Then we would understand reality. And, and, and uh, a great line in, in, in Plato's Republic is when uh, Socrates poses to someone, uh, what would happen if you managed to get yourself out of the cave, climbed up, saw the sun, and then went back down in the cave and tried to tell everyone else who was tied up that you, you saw the sun? And uh, the answer was, well, they will probably kill you, which uh, ultimately happens to Socrates, of course. He, he's, he has seen the sun. Um, so this is my strange frame of reference. I'm a creative guy, but like I'm thinking, this is, this is right. This is absolutely how I feel. Um, but then I got a strange obsession. That strange obsession was to, in fact, paint and draw Plato's cave over and over again. I don't quite know what was going on there, but I thought it was this hilarious joke that I, in fact, was drawing and painting Plato's cave. So he would think that was like the lowest form of art, but in fact, I was explaining his... Anyways, I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> So I drew it in books, I did, did paintings, I, I drew that urn up on the shelf five times. I even did that strange painting, uh, a drawing in the, in the far right, which is of the inside of a barn. But I took all the components, the three stakes, the blanket, the urn, from the cave, and I put it in there. And it, anyways, it was a strange obsession. But I was really into this notion. This is far before I'd, I'd ventured into any sort of creative profession. This is my frame of reference. Um, of course, there was another, uh, oh, what I was going to say is that would be a really great topic for another talk, just play this cave. Anyways, we'll go on. Um, <laughs> I uh, also had another influence, and, uh, and this was said to me by, by someone I know and love well. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't her really saying something bad about me. What it was was, uh, was, was my mom knew my, my artistic capabilities, but her comment was, you're not very creative, and, and, and that was because I was learning a craft. And when I was young, I would refuse an art class to do any of these sort of more modernist, experimental, sampling appropriation projects, which were all very postmodern and lovely, um, because I wanted to learn to draw. So I would give myself my own assignments. I would do a, I would do a piece on reflections. I would do a piece on shadows. I, I was just neurotically obsessed with craft. So, so it's funny, again, I, I put away the creative, I was working on a lot of logic, and I was working on a lot of craft. And you can see, apart from the really awesome hairdo in, uh, in there, this was, this was all me in high school. You know, I'm, I'm doing the plays, I'm creative, I'm doing all this art, but mom was right. It was not creative in, in that sort of sense. I was not being inventive. I was just learning craft. Um, 
So I was starting to put this together and trying to find a connection across my, my life that made a bit of sense. And I realized, and this is totally new and I'm a little freaked out by it, that apparently, starting at the age of three, everything in my life has taken exactly 10 years. So, and it's almost exactly. So it's a little terrifying. Of course, when you're three, you, you, know, you, you learn how to go to the potty. Uh, you go to preschool, and my sister was conceived. So I'm sure those three things together, there's some sort of oral anal fixation thing going on there. And, and uh, anyways, <laughs> that's where it started. Um, uh, as every man in the room would know, of course, you turn 13, you're a man. Um, and uh, <laughs> maybe that's 33, that's the next one. But uh, high school, 23, I got married. Um, I got a real job. And 33, I quit that job. Uh, formed a company, and I'm exactly 43 today. Uh, not today, today, but I am. Yes, never mind. Uh, so very strange uh, uh, coincidence. And what I realized is there were, there were certain focuses throughout this history. So from pre-elementary, high school, going to UBC, I ended up doing my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Strange for a guy who doesn't, didn't quite think he was going to be creative. Um, but my high school prep had all been for pre-med. Uh, and then I did exactly 10 years at DDB in characters. And it's been exactly 10 years uh, with subplot, so that's kind of odd. Um, but as I say, the, all my formative time was this, this, this craft logic, right? It's the idea of being able to do something that is called creative, but not really looking for creativity, and, of course, learning how to think. And that's, that's sort of the foundation of, of two things in school. You learn how to do, and you learn how to think. Um, DDB completely changed that. The currency at DDB was ideas. It's absolutely, in fact, in fact, craft was, it was, you know, craft was respected, but it, it wasn't the top of the pyramid either. It was all about a great big idea, uh, the wow factor. So I had to learn very quickly how to come up with ideas, and that was very, very new for me. Um, fortunately, it's a trick. Uh, it's a very simple little in your brain, and, and you, can, you can have what is referred to as ideas, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. That's, in fact, what synecdoche is. Um, and at subplot, it has very much changed. Uh, we aren't an only ideas currency uh, shop. It's very much more about making connections across a, a variety of, uh, of things. So this kind of became uh, my journey, I guess, from this fear, if you will, of, of creativity all the way through connection. Connection itself is, is a fantastic word, and I love it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, ne a nexus is a, is a connection point between two things. But the idea of a co-nexus is that both points that are, that are making a connection have equal validity or equal strength. So they are, um, they are uh, in balance with each other. So it's an interesting thought as, as you work on a connection. It's not just about the point in between two points, but it's the, the mutual respect uh, of the two objects that you're connecting. Um, and so that's really where they, the second part of my talk starts with synapses and synecdoches. I want to talk about my synapses a little bit, if you will. I actually tried to go to my doctors to see if they had any brain scans on file. Um, I, I couldn't find any. Um, I'm hoping that's not an indication that there were, in fact, nothing in there that they scanned. Um, so uh, for all of you that probably don't remember grade 8 uh, uh, biology, of course, you have your axon, your dendrite, you've got epinephrine and serotonin rushing between. And, uh, you know, this isn't just what makes my arms gesticulate. Uh, Mark knows how I like to gesticulate. It isn't just that. It's also, of course, the way you think, the way you act, the way you behave, your autonomic uh, nervous system, everything, right, is all controlled through the, through the synapses. Um, and on the other side, you, of course, have uh, what we all know is your you know, right brain, left brain. So we had one connection on the nervous level. You've got right brain and left brain, which isn't entirely uh, theoretically true, but it's kind of a nice paradigm that you have the, these two halves. The interesting thing, I think, about the, the creative brain particularly is uh, in the corpus callosum, which uh, is Latin for big body, just to... Uh, Trivia fact. Uh, it is, in fact, the part that channels between the two. So what you see on brain scans of very creative people is that the communication between the two halves is, is higher. So there's more brain activity in the corpus callosum. So again, you've got, uh, you've got your axons and dendrites. You've got your corpus callosum working. Um, and it starts to change your idea of maybe this, this creative logic spectrum. You know, I think I had in my head this idea that you were somewhere on this line. Right? You were either off being sort of a logical thinker or you were more of a creative person. That doesn't work. It's, it's not a good model at all. Uh, it's more likely that uh, a decent model would be that there's, you know, from logical to illogical, if those are opposites, and creative to uncreative. I'm sure that's not a word, but, you know, there's a spectrum there. And, in fact, you fall somewhere in that matrix. You know, you are 
illogical but very creative. There's lots of people like that. Um, or you're very creative and logical or somewhere along those lines. So they're not opposed forces. They're, in fact, linked. They're connected. Uh, another way to look at this, and I invented this one, so I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to see if this works, uh, is that creativity is an expansive force. Right? When you're creative, you're tending to extrapolate. You're tending to dream and think and add ideas and, and, and kind of expound and expand uh, your thinking. So it grows. Um, and in many ways, logic is the opposite of that. You're then chopping, chopping, chopping and bringing it down into some sort of order. And this is often the way the creative mind works. Is you, 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 you know, I hate the word blue sky, but I'll use it for like the one and only time, but you're, you're going out and expanding, and then you're saying, no, inappropriate, not right, not feasible, and you're kind of cutting down. Um, but again, for my brain, I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why, this area here, right at the highest point when you're expanding your creativity, right before you've narrowed it down, this is absolutely the shit show. This is, this is where my brain just like completely loses its mind. This is where I, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm quite lost. Um, and that's, again, what informed me for kind of having this nervousness and this uneasy relationship with creativity. Uh, so, you know, again, famous quote uh, from someone. Uh, and uh, it's true. My brain doesn't quite work right. That, that the problem with the way I think is that I obsess over solutions. I ruminate. I have a ruminative mind. And a ruminative mind, if you don't know it, is a mind that loops on itself a lot. So you're not just going A, B, C, D. You're going A, B, 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 A, A, A. It's, it's, it's horrible. And, and, uh, um, and then the anxiety kind of gets in there, which is great. And I'm also a chronic migraine sufferer. So it's an awesome place in this little head of mine. Um, you know, the rest of my body's fine, but this little space here is, is uh, kind of crazy. Um, and part of this is, of course, that my uh, lovely neurochemical imbalance is, uh, is in play. And the other reason is that with ruminative thinking, it kind of randomizes. I, I was trying to actually make this chart maybe loop on itself a little bit more, but it, 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 it's keynote. I can't, you know, I can't go that far. Um, <laughs> So it, it, you put those two things together, and, and what you realize, of course, is this is very bad for living. You know, my wife will tell you, like, choose a restaurant, and I'm like, well, I, you know, if I think, I, if I want to go there, that I want this, but if that happens, then we'll have to do this, but I don't know, it's kind of getting late, so, and we will wander in Paris for like four and a half hours, and it's like, oh my God, I'm starving. <laughs> I'll take anything, and it's like McDonald's. God damn. <laughs> Right? It's terrible for a living. This is like decorating the house, making decisions about kids. This can get absolutely crazy. Um, but it's great for my clients uh, because they get the benefit of a guy who's not going to miss a point. I absolutely think, well, if they do this, then we're going to do this. And if they go to this trade show, then I'm going to have to think this through. And I go through every little ruminative thing. And, and normally the clients, you know, who love and adore that part of me, kind of just cock an eyebrow when I'm having the conversation and go, <laughs> you thought of it all, you're good. Um, and the ones that don't want to think that hard go like, just go away. I think Mark said today, I will pay you like 100 grand to go away and solve my problem, get back to me later. Um, so it's great for clients. This is the neuroses that I learned to kind of harness. I, and thank goodness I found a way to get a job that actually made this make sense. Uh, I've done that a few ways. Um, Fortunately, over the years, I've learned this creative logic thing. A uh, bit of discipline, medication, that helps. Um, fences, I want to talk about fences. Uh, what I've done and what I need is to throw out a project, build fences around what I'm doing, to sample down those numbers of iterations that can drive me crazy. So I need to understand. I need to absolutely understand a situation, whether it's you know, finding a restaurant or whatever, I need to understand. I need to build a fence. I need to rope it in, make it really tight. Uh, I need to then have, the, I then have the ability to create. I'm finally able to do something once, once that's all fenced in. Uh, and then I can make it so. Then I can create. Um, it's interesting. In this creative stage, um, it, uh, it, it's a funny little process I go through. It starts with this kind of cocky self-assurance, like, ah, I've been doing this for 20-something years. I totally know what I'm doing. I'm pretty good. This is going to be awesome. Um, it quite quickly goes into solitary brooding. I usually stay home. My, my staff knows. I go home. I pace around. I might not be wearing pants. Um, and I kind of work on it, and all of a sudden, panic sets in. It's like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea. This, this is terrible. 
People are going to find out. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it goes right to the self-loathing, weeping, gnashing of teeth. It's like, it's like Dante's Inferno. It's, I'm at the lowest level of hell of this thing. Finally, I have some sort of breakdown uh, of some degree. Hopefully, it's a minor one. It's just my ego being broken down, not like a full-on like, you know, personality breakdown. Uh, and then, finally, the aha can come. Uh, it's a very strange little thing I do, and I do it every time. Uh, so this process that I've had to build into myself um, has, funnily enough, of course, turned into our four-step process, that subplot. I didn't realize this until I wrote the speech. Um, of discover, planning, creating, and manage. That's, of course, what we do. Uh, we've built a, a system to fence it in, to rein it in, to make it predictable, um, to bring some of those ideas of predictability and logic into what otherwise could be a completely chaotic thing. Um, now, the interesting thing is, is you know, a lot of my career, especially in the agency, that's the territory I got to play in. I got to play and create, right? I got to, I got to do my thing, and any time I would maybe step out of that, uh, I, would, I would get that answer. Why, why are we taking on this client? Aren't they, aren't they bad? Back to your typewriter. Um, you know, uh, but, um, you know, are, are we charging enough for this? Are we taking too you know, short a time? Go back. I was only allowed to do creativity. Of course, for a while, that's very exciting, but after a while, you start to, you start to kind of resent that. So I started to pick out little bits that I would do. Maybe I can help uh, in planning. Maybe I can go into manage. Maybe I can, like, help these other areas. Again, to, like, help me as a creative person have, have some sort of fence. Um, but it wasn't, of course, until subplot that I got to do that and get to go throughout the whole process. And this is design thinking. This is, this is you know, the designer's brain, the logic and the creativity coming together, connecting throughout a process. And that's really what it's been, is creativity and logic coming together, forming a process. Now, of course, that does mean that. So I'm hoping the subplot thing works out, because otherwise, uh, <laughs> got a problem. One personal cautionary tale before we get to synecdoches, which is a, which is a very quick uh, a portion. I learned something along the way, and it's very important. And for anyone who knew me in the, uh, in the final years of DDB, uh, this is maybe an apology and an admission at the same time. Um, when you're working uh, between 23 and 33, ideas are everything. It's the currency. Um, and uh, your migraines are increasing since I was 15. Uh, then your anxiety and rumination is also increasing. This is pre-medication, so, you know, it was bad. Uh, you work in an atmosphere which is competitive, not collaborative. It was, it was uh, a, an atmosphere where, like, ten people would go out and be challenged to create something, and one would win, and nine ideas would be thrown away. That was, that was the currency. Um, and uh, my personal and professional satisfaction was <laughs> going down. Um, I like to refer to uh, this, this level right here as the asshole zone. <laughs> Uh, so, you, you got you to know yourself to, uh, to get that right. All right, last little bit is on synecdoche. I wanna, my, the other half of this talk is really the, the, the way that ideas connect. Um, synecdoche, uh, and the concept here is really interesting. It starts with metaphor. Everyone knows generally what a metaphor is. It's a, it's a conceptual substitution. Uh, it could be in parable. It could be in, in statement. It's a literary term, but it's basically a substitution for what you're really saying. Um, a metonymy is, is a kind of substitution, very specific kind of metaphor, and a metonymy is when you substitute a, a, a kind of a part for a whole, but in a very specific way. So, for instance, if I said um, uh, Hollywood is, is, a, is a crazy monster of a, 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 you know, of a business, Hollywood, of course, is, is representing a, a business. Or if I said there's a lot of power in the Oval Office, you'd understand that what I meant was in the entire workings of the Oval Office, but I'm using that as a, a stand-in. Uh, synecdoche is even more specific, and that's parts of a whole. So that's like saying, hey, look at the skirt over there, right? That's, that's, it's, it's using a part. Uh, so, for instance, referring to someone as a creative would be a metonymy, and referring to someone as, uh, as a, hang on, yes, as a suit would be a synecdoche, because it's, it's part of their outfit. But I started thinking synecdoche, the idea of a part representing a whole, is, of course, precisely what we do for a living, particularly in this creative part of the process. Uh, synecdoches can be virtual, uh, sorry, virtual, visual and verbal. They're, uh, they're virtual would in fact be a great way of saying it. Um, TM. Uh, so that's what we do for a living. We create parts in uh, branding, in brand design, 
uh, in graphic design, we constantly are creating something to represent the whole. It could be as straightforward as a logo that represents a whole, but the brand, you know, a, a statement, a personality that represents the whole. This is the idea of synecdoche, and it has to be done with wit and with poetry to be something that, that's uh, potent. Um, it's referred to as a lot of things. In, in advertising, particularly, and in design as well, it's called the concept. What's your concept, right? And your concept shouldn't be, I thought it should be green. You know, what's your concept? What's your idea? It's often referred to as wit. That's a synecdoche. That's, that's kind of what it's called in, in design. Um, just to keep this in balance, though, uh, I think this is a great quote, and this actually is from someone other than me. Uh, gravity is a concept. You, my friend, have an idea. Uh, that was Bob Gill uh, reminding us all that uh, what we do is not, uh, you know, it's not relativity, folks. It's, uh, it is design, after all. Um, and very quickly, there's high and low metaphor. It's high and low design and synecdoche. So, you know, a simile, which we all know, is he runs like a gazelle. Whereas a metaphor would be, he is a gazelle. Now, you see this in design. You see, you see design that has no um, wit, concept, idea, synecdoche. It's communication. It can be absolutely, perfectly good communication, but it's not doing a second level. It can be decoration which is a step lower than communication. But again, it's, it's, uh, it's just doing what it's doing. And it looks good, does its job, but it's not actually representing something. It's not really telling a story. There's low synecdoche, which is kind of knock-knock joke, right? This would be my criticism of a lot of advertising. It is a knock-knock joke. It's, a, ah, it's awesome, and then it's gone out of your head. There's no connection. And uh, the high is, in fact, synecdoche and this idea of creating longer connections. Uh, so very rapid lightning, I'm going to show you uh, just a couple examples of what I mean by, uh, syne by synecdoche and wit. Um, most of our projects are so huge, it's not like we get the, the chance at every level to do this kind of thing. It's a very specific kind of task. But we try, even in huge identity systems that we do, to have some moments of wit and synecdoche to create a bag, you know, a product called Go that's kind of like a Gatorade, uh, you know, sports-enhanced product for dogs that now is a completely fresh, so we're making a pastiche, a play, a bit of wit on a fresh market. Uh, we might be having fun with a carrier bag that as you walk around with it, that cute little dog is, is licking your hand. Um, or even part of a, of, of a logo having just that little licky tongue, licky tongue we call it, in the middle of Pet Curie and just gives that little bit of wit, that synecdoche. But there's specific types, and I'll refer you to a book after, there's specific types of wit ideas that come together. Uh, juxtaposition and idea collision is when you take two things together, urban and food, and you put them together and you get urban fare. That's, that's how that came about. Uh, the exact same form is something we used for Okanagan Spring, handcrafted beer. Very straightforward. This is two ideas coming together to form one third thing. Um, there's the idea of, uh, I'm going to say fooling the eye because I hate saying that in French because I sound like an idiot, so I'm going to call it fool the eye, uh, and taking it literally. Right, so my son's birth announcement was in fact a fake wallet. It was a piece of paper all folded up with all my like proud pictures of Papa. It had my credit cards in it and the whole thing, and that's what I sent out to people. Um, something like uh, again, uh, it's a super oxygenated water. Well, then it's an oxygen tank, right? That's taking a form and that's putting it into the function. It's the exact same thing that might inform a business card. Uh, for a fashion stylist to be, in fact, a, a, a swatch book. Um, side note on this, for all those people doing business cards that are kind of cute and kind of do this joke, it's over. <laughs> so stop doing it. Uh, this, is, this is a knock-knock joke. I love knock-knock jokes, but this is a knock-knock joke. I've got a business and it's, uh, I'm going to make it like this. So anyways, that's, that's, my little, uh, that's my critique for the day. Um, Parts coming together to make a whole is another form of wit. You take uh, undersea uh, flora, seaweed, kelp. You take uh, a little bit of sea stars, and you take the water waves, and you've got the aquarium logo. Right? So three things coming together to make a whole. Um, Wordplay and coincidence. Finding in these words from the ERT, which is the emergency response team of the Vancouver police, that in the functions that they do is this fantastic coincidental wordplay uh, that informs all the types of things that they do. Uh, shift view. Shift view is the fact that as you shift and interact with something, some, a third thing happens. So you have this logo we did for change, that of course, uh, when you change your perspective, it in fact still says change. Uh, or a very similar idea, 
uh, for Canada Post where it's shift time, and as you interact with this, as if through time you do something, you're in fact, uh, uh, as we're encouraging adoption of pets, when you take those pets out of the cages to use them, uh, you, you've liberated them. So you've actually taken a step to, uh, to liberate pets. Um, second look, this is called ambiguity second look, and that is, seems like a stamp, seems like a photo, but on second look you go, wait a minute, that's the, that's the eastern border of, of BC that's being created by the hand. So again, these little, these little tricks that, uh, that work in the ideas. Um, synchronicity and parallel is the fact that for each of these sunglasses, um, their color and their action is being reflected in, in how hard the riders ride. So again, you're making a parallel between the, the, what they're wearing and what they're doing. Uh, I think I just have a couple more here. Uh, puns, we do a lot of these in the office because we, we, we like to play with words, so we name, a, we name something the public, and of course we then decide that there should be public transport cards that get you cabs, public consumption, public drinking, public meetings, public good. Uh, we create a whole identity system around this sort of pun and uh, wordplay. And uh, substitution, which is a fun one, whereas you just substitute one thing for another and it brings a third meaning. So if this is, in fact, the ultimate fitness water, then you should be able to substitute it in different situations and understand where it fits in there. Uh, and all of this, uh, and I would highly recommend, this is an old book, and it's really dated in a lot of the work, but this book, Smile of the Mind, is fantastic. It's my business partner's favorite book of all time. Uh, he lends it out to anybody who will come by the studio. Uh, so please, all come by the studio. Um, and uh, it goes through some of this uh, in, in the way that it talks about the connections you make in, in idea making. And... Uh, that's what I have this morning. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start off with a question myself and get everybody going, okay? I like it. Um, when has your process, your the connections, the creativity, the logic, failed you? I mean, we've all had those experiences. Does anything come to mind where you really face-planted with your creative process? Well, yes. Like, uh, I mean, at every stage. I mean, it, it fails me every stage, every time. Um, fortunately, there's enough stages that it generally gets back on track. I mean, we failed in projects, absolutely. We've done projects that in hindsight, I think that was, that was not right. You know, or we've made a compromise for a client, or we've believed them about something that maybe we didn't verify enough and, 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 and known it didn't work. But I fail at every stage, and I think that's why you know, I, I do need a group of people that I do now get to collaborate with. It used to be competitive, I do get to collaborate. They hold me in, they go, that's the worst thing I've ever heard of. You know, we have a wall of shame in the office, and, uh, and a lot of work goes up in that wall of shame. When you come up with an idea and everybody goes, wow, that made sense somewhere, but it, none of us get that, and up it goes. Uh, Liz gets a lot of ideas on that wall, too. She, no, I'm just kidding. Sorry. We all, we all yeah, we all fail. <laughs> Who has a question? Okay, we're done. Thank you. Oh. Hey, I'm Gord Ruby. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for coming again, Matthew. And uh, I'm wondering, you talked a lot about your sort of personal ways of thinking and just briefly touched on your interaction with clients. And I just wonder with your like process, maybe you can expand a bit on how you connect with, with your clients. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I described how I have this personal process that I had to kind of, you know, fence things in. And, uh, you know, it is in complete sync with what we do at work. Right, so we get we get often very open uh, problems from our clients. Right, Okanagan Spring Brewery walks in and says, "We've been we've been losing seven percent a year um, on sales. We don't know what to do. Should we redesign our logo?" And we say, "I have absolutely no idea. I have no idea if you should redesign your logo or if you should, you know, fly to the moon. I have no idea." Um, and we're very honest that way. Mark and I were talking the other night about the power of saying, "I don't know," uh, and we don't know. So that you admit that, you have no preconceived notions, and you don't go into it thinking, well, I'm a designer, so I'm going to make myself a project, right? I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to redesign everything you do. And we go in and we start with, what are people saying about you? What's the problem? What's the market conditions? What are your consumers thinking? We go all through that process. We might bring in research. We might bring in, um, you know, uh, studies. And we, we find out the problem, and then we plan it neurotically. I mean, we go like three or four or five months before we've even gotten to pen on paper. 
um, which for some clients drives them bananas because they're thinking like, just, I need a logo. I mean, come on, go. <laughs> and we might get to the end of it and say, logo not, has nothing to do with anything, you know, but I don't know until I go three or four months. Then we're able to, to dive into it, and then we're able to solve these problems. So it's, it's a very front-end loaded process, and I think it's the only way I can create, and it's the only way we as a company can create, and it's frankly the only responsible way to approach a problem and not just be a guy who says, yeah, my solution for everything is to draw a pretty picture for you. So. <laughs> who was over here? Was it you? Hi, my name is Niasa. And uh, our group was particularly interested in something you said very quickly and then moved on about <laughs> when you started working at DDB and you had to start working on ideas. And there was a little trick you pulled about turning a switch on in your brain. <laughs> Could you tell us a little more about that, please? Yeah, so you want to know the trick is what, is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's, it's funny. So, so. I, think I learned a lot from advertising when I was in that situation. It was really interesting. Characters was in its infancy. I was one of the first couple uh, designers in Characters, which was their dev design division. And it was a strange orphan, little bastard orphan of the agency. We were like the weird guys they didn't know what to do with. We had one computer for six people. And, uh, you know, we did some brochures or something, you know. And the ad guys, the advertising world has this kind of snappy concept world. And, and, and what I quickly realized is, is you got to put away all the, all the notions of design and layout and craft and all that and just think about this quick little catch. It can, it's, it's a lot like those bits of wit. What little twist are you going to put on um, that gets you the answer? Um, and so sometimes it is like a substitution, sometimes it's a metaphor, sometimes it's a knock-knock joke, but that's all you need. And, and I, I, I admired the fact that the ad guys could go in uh, to you know, multi-million dollar clients with huge ad budgets with stick men, stick people drawings. And they'd be like, ah, the joke is this. And they, they'd draw the stick men. Everybody would go, ah, that's awesome. And they'd get like approval to then go and do like a hundred grand shoot off of, off of stick people. And in the design world, it was all craft, 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 craft. And you'd slick up logos and you'd slick up, you know, drawings and all that. And I realized if I just could learn to turn my metaphor brain on and do that little simile, joke, metaphor, twist thing, draw it quickly and show it, I could get approvals to then do the whole project, and I, and I got past that hurdle. So that, ad, that first ad experience was invaluable for me, for sure. Hi. You were talking about like sometimes meeting three to four months to even think about a problem or, or get back to client or tell the client that you don't know initially. My question is, how do you get your clients to Agree to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we try to do that first. You know, uh, we t we tell them what, what what we're up to, and and uh, we don't win every, you know, every pitch when we talk about what we're going to do. There's a lot of clients that are like that. Sounds like a hassle. You know, that does. I'm not in for it. You know, I actually had a chart at one point that I cut because you know this would otherwise be like an 85 minute presentation, um, and it was the inverse proportion relationship of like hardworking clients and how neurotic you are and how like the more neurotic you are, the hardworking client is happier, but the lazy client is sadder because, because and, and it's true, like when, when, we, when we encounter clients who just kind of, just, just get me a logo, get me going, do this, and we describe how we're gonna approach the project, we generally don't win that project because they're thinking we're a total hassle. We had, we had one client who will remain nameless, but Roy will laugh, uh, that literally in a meeting said, you know what, your process sounds really deep, but you know, we've given up on perfection a long time ago. <laughs> We're like, this is not going to work, you know, it's not going to work. So it's kind of pre-vetted, but even along the way, we have to like rub their back a little and hold their hand a little. And, and it's not a case of, you know, making them agree or forcing them to agree or convincing them. It's just kind of like finding that they have that synergy with you and going along the path and being open about it. And, and, and yeah, even some of the big clients right before we get to creative are like, oh, it's just... Can we just, just draw me something? Show me a pretty picture. And then, of course, we spend the next month and a half just drawing, not even showing them something on a computer. And like, would you just put it on the computer? So we do have, and we know we, we have. So if you're, a, if you're a lazy client, our process is a pain in the ass. We're absolutely pain in the ass, grumpy, questioning too much, you know, people. And if you're a, a thinking client, we are the most wonderful, thorough, searching firm. So you got to find that connection before you even start.
Good morning. Thank you, Matthew. That was an awesome presentation. Thanks. Your typography is intimidating. <laughs> um, my question, we talked a little bit in our group about um, your process of breaking down um, and how you go through your creative process and eventually ends in self-loathing and breakdown, which is amazing because as a fellow creative, I'm sure we can all associate <laughs> with that. So I'm just curious, your process of how you come back out before your aha moment. Do you have exterior forces? Is it just yourself? Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we, as a, as a group, we kind of we can help each other through that kind of those those sad times. Um, but my breakdown, uh, my breakdown tends to be, and I, and I wrote I wrote an article on this, and I'm actually talking about this uh, at a conference um, next month. Uh, and that's it's, a, it's more a breakdown of my ego. I think what happens is you you there's two sides of your ego. There's the egocentric part, which most creative people have a reasonably inflated, you know, part. I think it's great. It's it's what makes creative people what they are. I can't, I've got to break that down. I've got to break down my cockiness. But I've also got to break down my, my, my ego, like the Freudian ego, where, where like, you know, I'm thinking about me. I'm thinking about the self. And if I'm at the center of the problem, then, then it's, the wrong, uh, it's the wrong locus. It's the wrong uh, sort of center, right? So I have to break me out of it. I have to get the garbage out of my head. I have to get the bad ideas out of my head. Like, it's like an exorcism of terrible design. And then finally, when I kind of like, oh, I've got nothing left. That's when you have finally opened yourself up to actually create. And uh, sometimes, I, I don't know, I, I've never learned to just bypass all the self-loathing and just get right to the like having no ego part. For some reason, I have to suffer first. Um, and everybody in the office knows it when I'm like all e Eeyore is what they call me. I get all Eeyore about it. And I'm a, my mother gave me that nickname, so, you know. Um, but we also really help each other, right? I've got a great group of people that I could come to and say, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. And we're able to actually bat it around and add to it and kind of prop each other up. So it's pretty special to be able to do that. Okay, we can do two more. One in the middle here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Hi, Matthew. My name's Maya. Hi. Hi. Um, so as a creative director, what would you say would be the top three characteristics that make you successful? Ooh. Uh, I, yeah, I'd love to put neuroses on there. That probably doesn't help. Um, or you could just spit out answers. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Well, I think uh, it's, it's a really good question. Um, I, I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm a, if I were to do a whole other talk on creative direction, I would also call myself an uneasy creative director. Uh, Roy knows this very well. I, I love being a designer. But directing kind of can also drive me kind of bad because I'm like, no, let, I'll do it. L let me have it, right? We call it, we call it steering in the office. It's like, just move over. I'm going to drive. I'm going to drive. I'm just going to do this thing, right? So uh, I find that I have a lot of skills that are actually terrible for creative direction um, because I'm a roll up my sleeves kind of guy. Um, but I've learned, right? And it helps to be surrounded by a lot of talent so that, you know, I'm, I'm finally in my wizened years learning that, that other people's personalities can come out. So I think as a creative director, beyond being a designer, it's the ability to drop the ego, identify talent, identify ideas in somebody else's head, and foster them and nurture them. Don't turn them into you, but to bring them out. And I, I've had relationships before where, where I haven't had that freedom with someone above me, and, I, and it's been very frustrating. Um, but it's, it's, it's the only way to approach another creative person is with that incredible respect and to bring it out of them. Teach them your wisdom, teach them like tricks you've learned, but let them be them. So I'm still learning that one though. <laughs> okay, last one. Who's got a killer question? <laughs> Man, you have intimidated this crowd. Look at the silence. Okay, there we go. <laughs> the hands go up. Yeah. Morning. Hi. Um, I just had a question about the aha moment. Now, yes. I, it's kind of a dumb question because it's, typically it's obvious, like, aha, yeah, we got it. But what, what sort of defines or what, how do you arrive or how do you know you've arrived at that aha moment? Yeah, you know what? And that's, it, it, it's a great question because I think early in, in anyone's career, you don't have enough reference points to know when you have an aha. I, I see, I've seen historically, I've seen even in our shop, you know, uh, a designer comes with a number of things 
And they, they honestly don't know which of the five is, is, is the best. They, they, they don't know because they're so close to it, they're so new to it, and there's some instincts that get developed that you just go, nope, it's that one. There's, there's criteria, of course. I mean, you go through and say, well, does it meet the brief? Does it meet the target objectives? Does it meet all that blah, blah, blah? Like, it, it all should do that. Um, but boy, there's just, and, I, and, and it's funny, whenever we ignore that, I mean, sometimes we might have that aha moment come first. We had the first idea and we go, aha, and then we get guilty. We're like, that was probably too quick. <laughs> um, I'm going to go injure myself for a while thinking, you know, and so we go away for like eight more days and I, I, I did this and then we keep going back. No, it was that, that was the one and we knew it, but we should have just like stuck with it. So I have found that it, you know, there's all the logic you can put in the world, but aha is, is, it is that magical starseed undefinable thing. I wish it weren't so because it would be better for like all the check boxes, but you'd absolutely know. Um, and then, and then you, and the great thing is, aha has nothing to do with whether the client's going to say aha too. That's just your aha, right? <laughs> so the other trick is not, and I think why our process is 95%, especially at the beginning, 95% thinking, 5% comping it up, maybe 2% comping it up. Think, 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 and imagine, 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 then just sketch that sucker up as fast as you can and get into a meeting. Because if I fall in love with my aha, well, maybe I'll see if drop shadows make it look better, and I'll <laughs> slick it up on a bottle. Then I've completely fallen in love with it, and then when the client goes, that's shit, I'm like, oh, I'm so wounded, you know, and you're, you're hurt, and you're sad, and you resent it, and you get angry at your client, and you, you'll never, I'll never come up with a better idea than that one, right? So you comp it, you throw it out in the world, and then you, and then you can work on it. And the other thing, just as a last little bit on there, and I can't remember who said this in a speech I once heard, but there is not one solution to a problem. There are a hundred fantastic aha moments to any problem. And so this idea that like either in a meeting you can pitch one idea to a client, I got one idea, that's all you get, right? Or that, that if they don't like it, I'm supposed to walk, uh, is ridiculous. Um, there are so many ways of looking at problems. Um, there's an aha the next time you approach it, and if they reject it, there's an aha the next time you approach it too. So it's hard work though. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> yeah, how about I for it? Okay, cool. Thank you from, oh. from, the, from the group. Very nice. Appreciate it. Thanks, Matt.